May I have your attention? Please welcome Jacqueline Blackburn, Associate Scout Ventures, Mayel Gave, CEO, Techstars, Kristen Kalurgis, Managing Director, Global Head of Alternative Investments, JP Morgan, Tashi Nakanishi, Managing Partner, Heartbeat Ventures, CEO, XPV Group, and Ali Rosenthal, Founder and Managing Partner, Lead Out Capital. All right, I am super excited to be here. Uh, for those that I haven't met yet, my name is Kristen Kalurgis Roland. Um, my team calls me KK. I'm married to Roland. It's weird to go by KKR when you lead alternatives, so I don't. Um, but I've been at JP Morgan for over 14 years, going on 15. And within JP Morgan, there's multiple ways in which we invest in um, founders, VCs, late stage, growth equity, buyout, et cetera. But within the private bank in particular, where I sit, um, we oversee about $150 billion in assets, $25 billion in hedge fund strategies, the rest is in private investment strategies. We've been doing it since the 90s. Um, we realized that venture was really hard, and some people were better than JP Morgan. So a lot of what I do is invest in third parties, and we think about mandates that we want our private bank individual clients to access. Um, and the trend has certainly been behind diverse founders, diverse missions, et cetera. So we'll talk much more about that. Um, I have awesome partnerships throughout the firm. There is, um, within asset management, there's a group called the Private Equity Group. We call them PEG, because we acronym everything at JP Morgan. They were started in 97. They invest on behalf of institutions in a traditional fund of funds business, and they back emerging managers, as well as some of the largest and longest investors in venture capital. Um, we have a investment bank and private bank partnership in a, in a system that we are launching this week, if you haven't heard about it, Capital Connect. There's a booth nearby, right, Judith? Where is it? Right outside? All right, check it out. The idea is, is that ideas are everywhere, but capital is not. And we want to find ways to connect the venture community, the people that we know and love, to the people that invest behind you. And so there is, um, it's a new digital interface. It's incredible. I'll talk a lot more about that throughout the conversation. But Capital Connect, I'm going to keep saying it, and eventually you'll maybe check out the booth. Um, and then I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves, because they're pretty incredible. Um, and then we also have what's called Project Spark at JP Morgan. This is firm balance sheet, $160 million commitment that we made. And we've so far backed 23 found, um, businesses, I should say, two that are up here today. So we'll talk about why they actually took capital from us, because I'm always interested to hear the answer. Um, and a bunch of partnerships along the way. So I'm going to have everyone do a quick intro of like who they are and how they got to this stage. Allie, I'm going to start with you. Hey, Ali Rosenthal, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm the founder and managing partner at Leadout Capital. Um, we are a uh, stage specific, so we're early, pre-seed, seed, small A's. Uh, sector agnostic, we focus on software, but generalists. Um, and we look to back what we call customer segment experts whose uh, expertise and knowledge of a market give them an edge uh, so as to win. Uh, and uh, I'll pass it to my... my, my Wait, and the name oh. stems from, I thought this was cool. You're oh, a cyclist? Uh, I was a professional cyclist for a short period of time. And for those of you who know cycling, a lead out is a term in a, uh, you know, basically for a race formation at the end of a bike race, whereby the team gets it in an echelon shape to bring their fastest teammate winner and set them up for the win. So it's a metaphor for early stage investing. Uh, and the kind of work we think your earliest investors, advisors, supporters, team, should be doing uh, to set you up for your win. Uh, it's so hard to go from zero to one. It's so hard to build companies, uh, and it takes people. Uh, so that's what we focus on at Lido. And Allie's being super humble. We'll talk about her history, being an operator, working with businesses, working in you know within um, growth stage, later stage, etc., and why she ended up where she is today. Mayel, I'm going to kick it over to you next. All right, happy Tuesday, everyone. Uh, so I'm the CEO of Techstars. We are the largest pre-seed investor in the world. We have 3,100 companies in our portfolio. Uh, and we do that uh, in 15 plus countries around the world and many, many cities uh, across the United States, including Silicon Valley since two months ago. Woo! So I'm very excited to be here. And the reason in particular why we are on stage is because a few months ago we raised, with the help of JP Morgan, an $80 million fund focus on underserved founders, and in particular, black and brown founders that will be allocated across uh, nine cities in the United States. 
United States. The first five are already in program, so we've already made 60 investments, out of which 70 plus percent are actually black and brown founders, and I'm very, very proud of this number. We'll get into that in a lot more detail. Mayel also was a founder of companies and operator and everything else in between, so we'll go through that. Okay, this is like, the stories are gonna keep getting better and better, so just get excited. All right, Jacqueline, you're next. Hi everyone, uh, Jacqueline Blackburn. I'm an investor at Scout Ventures. We're an early stage venture firm based in New York City as well as Austin. We focus on frontier technology, so technology that has both commercial and defense applications. My background was I spent almost seven years as an explosive ordnance disposal officer, so I know very intimately some of the technologies that we have invested in under the Scouts balance sheet um, being utilized um, in the military uh, space. We focus on um, finding founders that are hard to come by, founders that have a military background, um, which is what brings me here to this uh, stage today. Awesome, Tashi, over to you. Uh, probably shortest introduction, um, a managing partner of Heartbeat Ventures, uh, which we'll be announcing and speaking more about uh, tomorrow. On the main stage, right? On the main stage, so uh, hopefully you guys can make it. All right, and Kevin speaking with Michael Longin, I think. It's like a fireside chat tomorrow? Yeah, I think yeah. it's the fireside. All right, yeah, yeah. so be sure to be there um, if you aren't already planning on going. Um, okay, so I, so the panel is called The Famously Overlooked. And so what we want to talk a lot about is this concept of ideas are everywhere, but capital is not. And so ways in which you sort of found your way or found the background of which you wanted to think about investing behind. Um, and, so, and some of the advice that you have for people along the way. Because there's a lot of founders in this room that are trying to think of who they partner with um, and what differentiates one from another and how they differentiate themselves. So, Mayel, I'm going to have you maybe kick it off. Um, just from the pure number of founders that you back, and then we'll go across the room. But like, talk a little bit about what you look for in founders, and then what tech, how you think about partnership with tech stars on the opposite side as well. Yeah. So one of the key principles that that we believe in at tech stars is that um, there is a tremendous blue ocean of founders out there, and that most VC only swim in a tiny swimming pool. And our job is to go and find the founders that are completely overlooked. We do a lot of ecosystem development activities. We spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with founders, even before we start investing in them, even before we welcome them into our program. We encourage them to come to our happy hours and all the events that we do in person around the world. Um, one of our rules also is that we read every application because one of the things that we've noticed is that underserved or underrepresented founder, whatever terms you want to use, uh, tend to be kicked out of the pipeline of VC basically at the beginning of the application. And it's, it's something that is basically a huge problem. And so we, try to, we make sure that we read every application and try to talk to every founders. And then we welcome them into our programs. And the, the actuator is really a way to change the trajectory of any founders that comes. And it's like a them, boot camp. It's like a boot camp. Like think about it as a boot camp on steroids where by the end of the three months, you really want to take a holiday, but you can't because you have a business and you need to run it. But what we do is when we, when we talk to founders, we, we, we think with them about in their toolkit, what are the things that they don't have? What are the network, what are the connections that they don't have? What, are the, uh, what is the experience that they don't have? What are the things that because of their general background, whatever that is, it's still missing in their toolbox. And so the program that we put in place is to make that happen. And then we connect them uh, to probably one of the best, I'm biased, but one of the best network in the world uh, because we have 7,000 alumni, 8,000 mentors, 21,000 investors who have invested into one of our companies. And we're like, we're here to, we are, we're here to help you. We give you money, we give you services and, and support, and then we give you the network because no one succeeds alone. You are very particular though with like um, valuation. So like for some of the founders in this room, give them a sense of like when you're looking to get involved. What's the like threshold that you look at or the stake that you're looking to take? In terms of, in terms of valuation? Yeah. 
Yeah, so we, we're very early stage. We, we like to say that we invest usually in two, hum, two people and a dog. That's about the stage where we want to we wanna see founders because we believe that we, we're going to be with you in the trenches and we want to help you. So the terms are very public. Uh, it's $120,000. Uh, it's $20,000 plus a $100,000 convertible note, and we end up with between 6 and 10% of, uh, of your equity. Uh, we believe, again, that what we offer is the, the, mm, the capital that I just mentioned, but also the program and the services and then the, the mentor network. So that's a full deal. And the networking thing, um, it's interesting because I feel like once you put the time and effort in it, it then becomes just super easy. Like even coming up with this panel and you look across, like, this took us about, I don't know, an hour to think about who we wanted on stage and who we could back and whatnot. But, Ali, I would love for you to touch on, like, as you've grown up in this industry and you've sort of seen the network effects, like, what has it meant for your portfolio and as you're starting your business? I know you just closed Fund 2 um, earlier this year. But, like, talk a little bit about, like, the network effect and how you think for those that are the, quote, famously overlooked, like, what are the things that we could do together in general? Well, maybe just a little a little background. I, uh, um, I, I worked as an operator at um, a business that kind of defined network effects. Uh, it used to be called Facebook. It's now called Meta. Um, and you know when and then and then more recently, I was at a, 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 a fintech firm uh, called Wealthfront. I've had a number of operating roles. So I actually think some of the pattern recognition, if you will. Uh, that you get from operating and actually have to, having to ship a product and hire people and fire people and manage people um, is invaluable, um, especially at the earliest stages of company formation and trying to go from zero to one. Um, and I think it's partly my experience. My team is um, made up of former operators uh, and, and uh, you know, just recognizing Sometimes the people on, on, your, on the team, on like your product team that you would hate to lose, like your product wouldn't ship or you wouldn't know why it was not performing or like your cohort analysis was wrong or you know, you, your engagement was down, are, are not the people that necessarily tell the story the best or uh, uh, necessarily manage up the best. Oftentimes those people are not people who society typically has given over our long history the benefit of the doubt, um, but they're the people from your team that you would just hate to lose. Um, they don't necessarily get to see themselves in the current marketplace as founders. Uh, they don't believe necessarily that they could go raise money and get, and get money. Uh, there are some more stories now of, of, of breakout successes, uh, especially over the past three, four years of more female um, BIPOC, queer founders, objectively diverse founders, under, underrepresented founders, and certainly underrepresented when PitchBook and other analyses come out about who actually has gotten access to both in dollar amounts and number of companies founded by underrepresented founders looks like. And it's, we've got a lot of work to do still. Um, so thank you to Techstars and, and to JP Morgan and, and to all of you guys, especially founders who are just going out there and and, and, and telling your story uh, again and again. But it's kind of that giving the benefit of the doubt and trying to listen differently um, that, we, that we look for. And, and I think the combination um, at our firm of operating experience uh, and investing experience, my, my, my partners uh, uh, both invested for a long, long, long time. I was an angel investor for about 10 years before starting my fund. And actually was when I was raising, kind of pointed to a lot of angel investments I made that fit the thesis that I ultimately went to, went to you know, institutional or I investors around, um, just built more and more conviction. Not only is it the right thing to do for society to have more representation in who gets to found and get back, gets the support of networks like the ones that all, the, all of the people sitting on this stage represent are, but it's, it's critical for our society going forward as more things get automated, as AI you know, becomes the way so many of us operate in our daily lives. If it's just one segment of founder type and 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 playbook that um, gets to gets to in, you know basically write the future, that's that's a scary thing if it's not representative of our of our entire society. No, so you know, most of you asked the question just about network. Our fund too so far is 90% of our founders are objectively diverse. It's not because we're a quota driven fund. Uh, we don't say you need not apply unless you check a box of some sort. 
But we look for customer segment experts whose lived experience in a market really gives them an edge with respect to how to build a software-driven solution for that market. And there are so many markets that are going to benefit from great software innovation. And we are really focused on that edge that you find in founders who really understand empathetically a pain point because they've either lived it or they've spent the time. I was going to say, the like living part is probably the most important thing. I've talked to a lot of GPs over the years, and I'm like, what differentiates when you first found that founder, like what it was? And the one thing that I heard over and over again, like you use the word empathy, like the being vulnerable part is super important. And the one thing that stuck with me and what caused our group to really look at this, a couple years ago, I was speaking to someone who like spun out a Kleiner, is an expert in digital health. And I said to her, like, why do you win these deals? Like, why do the founders want your money? And she was talking about, um, she was like, because I was in a room with seven other men and I'm the only one that was facing menopause, which is what this like team was solving for. And she was like, the ability to connect and solve those problems is super important. And she was like, and that I face that every single day because I'm just a few years away from it. And it was like getting uncomfortable talking about like menopause that with my own team that was like, this is why we need to have a diverse group of founders attacking real life problems with a diverse group of individuals. And so it's more of like those stories which like are kind of uncomfortable because we haven't really gotten deep over so many years that I think are super important. Um, Tashi, I'm gonna kick it over to you. Talk a little bit about when you're thinking about who you wanna partner with on a go forward basis. Like again, how do you think about building that network? What founders stand out to you and differentiate themselves for you? Yeah, for, for Heartbeat, I think one of the um, kind of uh, building on, on what you mentioned earlier is for, for us, um, we don't really talk about diversity, and that, that might be a little bit weird to say here, but for, for our team, it, it comes naturally to us. Yeah. It's not something that is a KPI or anything. It's because what you mentioned, like we already connect with them and we have similar backgrounds. So for us, it turns into just a natural, you know, comfortable conversation. So for, for the folks that are here, and they feel a little bit, you know, out of place when when, when they go to certain firms. Um, I think we are a place where you could you could come and feel very comfortable and natural talking about your background. And are you are there sectors you're focused on? Themes? How do you think about when you're building the portfolio and who you're looking to partner with? Yeah, we're we're generally early stage. Um, our sweet spot is probably um, under 100 million, and we're really thinking about what are the drivers that gets the company to a billion dollar company. Yeah. So so a, a 10x outcome. Okay. Um, that's it. <laughs> no, no that, that, that that's definitely not it. Um, but I think another thing that that's unique to us is that we're collaborative. We don't we're not always trying to just like uh, squeeze ourselves in or squeeze people out. Yeah. We we want to work with other firms. Um, and uh, yeah, try try to work with other uh, work with other folks. I love that. Um, okay, so Jacqueline, we were talking about your experience in the Navy, and how it relates to like. I was like, so how did you end up in the venture world? Talk a little about like how your experience drove your decision making of where you wanted to go longer term, and then ultimately when you think about partnering with entrepreneurs, like advice and things that you see sort of in that same vein. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Uh, during my time in service, I was, uh, like I said, in special operations, so I deployed uh, once to the Middle East, the other one to uh, Africa, and so I was with these small unit teams. They were eight-man platoons. I was, like, one of the first females at my mobile unit, and so it was, like, me and a bunch of dudes going on deployment, and so we would spend six months at a time um, just operating overseas with an objective or a series of objectives, and we were basically on call 24 seven. And that's very similar to startup life, actually. Um, if you think about it, you think about like the grit, the persistence, the consistency of effort that these early stage founders have to go through. It's a lot like running a team for a deployed. So that was kind of the initial kind of parallels I had in wanting to get into venture. Um, and I think, you know, it's really hard to get into the venture side as an investor. Um, so, you know, being able to have the opportunities I had at JP Morgan, working with incredible people to help build a network, to help understand kind of the ecosystem was something that, you know, helped get me to the next stage in, in terms of like, you know, now being on the other side as an investor. Um, I think also too, you know, at Scout, we really look at, we really focus on kind of that dual use, the 
um, use of both the technology on the commercial side as well as um, the defense side. So we network with a lot of other VCs in um, that are also veterans that are also focused in dual use and that that you know that breeds its own network in itself. Um, but I think too, like you know, when when founders reach out to to investors, like it is the investor's job to support you, right, as a founder. You should, like, investors should be spending 80% of their day talking or thinking about founders. Just like founders should be spending 80% of their day thinking or talking to customers. So in that same light, even if, like, we can't get there um, with the company and the founder um, in terms of capital, it's about the network and it's about, ex like, opening them up to other investors, like investors, it's a close, tight-knit community. So investors that maybe are fun, are looking for opportunities to work with founders in a specific industry, we probably know about it and we can probably connect you. So I think it takes transparency on both sides. It also takes founders asking investors for help and asking, like, doing their homework and being like, hey, I know this person's connected with this person. Maybe you can connect me. It's okay to ask, right? If you don't ask, you don't know. Um, so those are like, so those are some of the, the tips I have in terms of founder investor relationships. Yeah, I also think um, you're right. There's so many people that like have the capital to give, but it's no. There's a there's a lot of people that would actually give you money, even though it doesn't feel like that certain days, I'm sure. Um, but it's figuring out like what strategic advantage they're going to help you achieve over time. Like you were talking about how your advisory board is a lot of people that were like ex Department of Defense, and like that might be important for certain technologies that you're investing behind, etc. Mayel, I'm going to switch it back to you. When you think about some of the like mistakes or the outbreaks that like happen in the portfolio, are there any commonalities of what you see when it comes to whatever it is within an entrepreneur? So it's like things that they did to attract the capital and or like making it through the boot camp successfully. I know you have a few founders in the audience, so maybe we'll get them on stage at some point, but like Talk about like, yeah, here we go. If you're a Techstars founder, can you raise your hand? Raise your hand if you're a Techstars founder. <laughs> Woo! That's pretty cool. Woo -woo. Um, so like, w give us a little bit like the people that are maybe even starting out. Like what are some of the advice that you'd give them when they're looking for capital, and looking for partners? So we tell them first that no one succeeds alone. And, and that's, by the way, one of the reasons why it's so hard for a lot of the founders that we're talking about is because they may not have the network. Their parents, my parents didn't give me any network. Like they didn't even know the word entrepreneur when I was growing up. So like uh, going and fundraising was like a whole adventure because I didn't even know venture capital existed. So the first thing that we tell them is no one succeeds alone. Think about the people that you surround yourself with. Uh, within your team, within your board, it doesn't have to be a formal board, but whoever you go to when you, when you have a question to ask, um, f surround yourself by, with, with, uh, with people who are basically going to go and be there to help you. If you don't have that network, uh, come to tech stores or come to other entrepreneurial network. I bet you that wherever you are in the world, there is an entrepreneurial network nearby. So if it's not Techstars, that's fine. That's a little sad, but that's fine. Go, go to whatever entrepreneurial network you have there and start networking and getting, getting to know people. So that's the first thing we, we, we tell them. The second thing we tell them is it's going to be really hard. Being a founder, I think that there's this mythology that you, you, you can work a few years and then you're going to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. Guess what? I've been a founder three times. It is so hard because you sometimes feel like you're on top of the world and then and then then you feel like your company is about to get bankrupt and often it happens within the same day uh, and then you have to explain that to your family and your spouse but like why are you going through this roller coaster of emotions uh, it is really really hard and so back to like no one succeeds alone that's why it matters to have people around you but equally important you have to have it in you because you're going to spend the next 10 years of your life at best working on something where the entire world is going to tell you that it's likely a stupid idea. This is why I keep saying, like, entrepreneurs are magicians. What you do, if you're an entrepreneur, what you do is you take a problem that the world is telling you it can't be solved, and you somehow decide every day to wake up and actually go and try to solve that problem. And guess what? Most of you will actually solve it. 
if that's not magic, I don't know what that is. So what we tell them is, no one succeed alone, create your network, believe in yourself, because you're going to need a ton of it. Make sure that you know why you're in there, because it's going to be really, really hard work. Okay, so give me that next step, though. You said, like, you didn't grow up in a family that had the connectivity. Like, what did you do? Like, what were the things that you did early on to create that, like, group? I went to whatever network existed. Like, I even went to, uh, uh, what is it, like, suing network? Like sewing, yeah. Sewing network. Like, like you were sewing network? Yeah. Or like sweaters? What were you doing? Yeah. Yeah, just like... Uh, just to meet people. Embroidery. O okay. Yeah. Why? Because it was like, I'm sure there's going to be people that I don't know. I went there, I met with them, and guess what? One of them was the wife of a guy who was running a small business in the area, and he had money to invest, and she said... Oh, you're Why? literally talking about anything, like oh, any yeah. networking I event. I was like, any networking event. I mean, <laughs> given my age, like at the time, Accelerator did not exist, uh, and I certainly didn't know about it. I was like... I'm going to go and talk about my idea. This is the other thing we talk to founders about is your idea is just that. It's an idea. So don't keep it close to your vest because what you need to do is you need to get people excited about it. What is going to make the difference between you being successful and not being successful is your network and your ability to execute, not how much of a kick-ass idea you have. So talk about it. Go and talk to everyone until they're so tired that when they see you, they move away. Yeah. Like That's the goal. <laughs> So be annoying. Um, okay, how do you, Ali, I might ask you this question. So r in the last 12 months, it's kind of incredible to see the massive shift of like focus on profitability and all this stuff. But like some of those early ideas take a long time to be profitable. And to Mayel's point, you got to like keep going. How do you help founders like balance, we might be in a recession or about to be in a recession? And like what advice are you giving people today when you think about like, how the macro has impacted certain micro ideas in all of your time in industry, being an angel investor, like, I know we didn't prep this question, but I just feel like it's important because so many people are like, are we in a recession? Are we about to be in a recession? What it, like, what does that mean for the people in this audience who have businesses? What advice are you giving them? Well, er early, early stage, ha interestingly, is somewhat shielded still, I think, from the macro. Um, uh, I read this interesting article the other day, which is an interview with the great investor uh, Bill Gurley from Benchmark, who yeah. mentioned um, uh, Stephen Covey's comment about uh, spheres of influence and networks, to your point, and Warren Buffett's comment about spheres of competence. And Gurley's point was that as early stage founders, like your sphere of competence is not to know what the macro environment is or is not going to do. You should just be very, very focused on, and like focus, focus, focus. Like 90% of whether or not you succeed is gonna be on execution. And as a founder, you, like we always tell your like founders that you're, you basically are responsible for raising money, so telling the story, hiring great people, and getting out of the way. And, and making sure that you don't go out of business. So telling the story, hiring great people to execute, raising more money. So that focus is super, super important. So the macro at the early stage, it, to the, I mean, you can't control it. So control what you can control. Um, I think that people always can get more done on fewer resources. Um, so to the extent like in portfolios at, 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 at early stage firms, you know, layoffs and rifts, like they're painful, but doing it faster and getting to do more on, on and extending your runway in a time like this is probably a wise thing to take a look at. It is taking longer to raise rounds. There is more of a focus on profitability. I've spent a bunch of time of late um, speaking to friends and peers of mine in the growth equity uh, sectors of, um, of the private equity and alternative asset market. And like things are People are doing very, very little. That's not necessarily true at the early stage. Yeah. Um, still, an idea, two, two founders and a dog, a great idea, that focus, that customer segment expertise, that resilience, that like, I've got, I know this problem and I've got to solve. You can do a lot with a little bit of money, but be prepared for it to take longer to raise your next round and be very, very focused on your metrics because that's kind of the environment right now. But, you know, you can't worry too much about what's going on with the Fed or you know, mortgage rates, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, now if you're in prop tech and you're trying to get more people access to mortgages, you might need to be an expert on that and worried about that. But 
I think the broader macro environment, fortunately for those of you who are starting out raising money for your product or service company, is not as as much of a factor. But once you once you raise, if you're lucky enough to do so, you're going to want this could last for a while, so yeah. you're, you, like, be prepared to show up with the numbers the next time. And I think great founders and great ideas are still getting, are still getting great valuations and, and great investors coming off the sidelines and investing. So I do feel like now is the time for like the venture and some of the early stage folks, because you're right. Like, there's a lot of venture people who wanted to do the follow-ons because they were like, I already did the work on the company and I already backed them and I'm on the board and now they're doing the next round I want a piece of that. And now they're quickly retrenching because they realize that valuations got a little too hot on that side. And so most of those people in the, if you're a hedge fund crossover, if you're still alive, like you're not really adding privates to your portfolio because you can't add a liquidity because your publics are down 40% if you're lucky. Not everyone, but I'm being dramatic here. But um, the point being is that like there are more and more people, especially my clients who are looking to back earlier stage. And in particular, when you look at the data now, there's people like we, one of our partners, GCM Grover out of Chicago, they've been intentional about backing diverse founders since 07. And we looked at the data and diverse founders actually outperform their non-diverse founders over time, which is why when I had a family come to me and then they said like, here's my goal. I don't want concessionary returns. I just want to back great founders that um, this one family in particular wanted to put $100 million behind black and brown founders in the mostly venture space, a little bit of growth that they allowed. And there's only a few people that like do it on a mass scale, but there's so many people that do it and are breaking out like you all, as you think about like, you're still early. Like you're even yourself are emerging as fund managers, which is pretty cool. Techstars is different, but um, anyways, thought that was really cool. We have gotten a couple questions that came in, which are like far better than the questions I would ask. So I'm gonna go to them. Um, Tasha, I'm gonna start with this one with you. What is a good, when you talk to founders, I want everyone to answer this question. So maybe I'll, I'll push a little bit on making these answers quicker, but mm -hmm. what is a good time distribution of a founder's time being spent on? We talked about recruitment, customers, but in general, as you're advising founders, where are you telling them to spend their time? Um, Not in the macro, where should they spend yeah, their time? Yeah, no, no, er early stage, I think the, the most important thing, and, and we're, we're building as well, so the, the most important thing for me is, is building the culture. Um, so for, for us, um, my company is spit split between an investment team and, and engineers. And, the, and an investment mentality is very different from the engineer mentality. So even when it comes down to the words that you use, like we, we don't really talk about investments or we don't talk about um, en engineering. We say, hey, we're building a platform. And, then, and that equalizes the, the, the two different uh, segments. So I think it's really important to, to work on um, culture first. So team building culture and then really understanding, you know, what are your first 100 customers going to look like, right? Um, you're, you're not going after 7 billion people. You need to understand who your first 10, who your first 100 uh, customers are. So really focusing and talking about who those people are. Okay. What would you say? Uh, three things. Uh, one, your mission, crafting the story. And then two, the team, how you retain talent, how you, um, you know, maintain a, like a culture um, and then three like networking outside of fundraising like 100% you should be talking to people trying to get yourself out there as much as possible even when you're not fundraising. Well so we tell them oh, I tell them it's 40% spend on your customers and your product 30% spend on building the right team 30% uh, figuring out how to fundraise, and because you're an entrepreneur, 100% is definitely not enough, so you need to add another 30% for everything else that you have to deal with. And so about 130%, that's how you should You didn't should even think. add in like life. Oh, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> that's when you get to 150. Got it, okay. <laughs> Ali, what would you say? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> it's a, when you're talking to founders and you help them think about how they balance and spend their time, like great, entrepreneurs, what are they, how do they break apart their time? Uh, I know it's going to depend uh, Yeah, on I mentioned time. before, like, I, I, like you, you have to, you know, you, are, you have to tell your story, you have to raise money, you have to make, sh you have to hire great people and, and make sure that you don't run out of money. I mean, that's, and that comes in all these forms, right? Um, I think the thing that we emphasize the most at lead out is like really understanding the customer, right? So that's going to, that's going to enable you to 
scale your product. And uh, if you lose focus on that and you're too focused on how to ra raise that hot round and you forget who your customer is, that's, that's going to come back to bite you. I also think like spending the more, okay, so my husband, I call him a wantrepreneur. Um, he's almost there. But he, when we, I went to like a thing, he's in the golf industry and I went to like this big PGA show down in Florida and I, every year I would spend time, I would take a couple days off work and go help him, et cetera. And he's, so, he's an engineer by background, so he's really good at the product, but he was really bad at the pitch. And the pitch was like seven minutes, which I was like, no one has seven minutes for you, like ever, especially in these things. So like spending time on the elevator pitch, like that should be the very first thing you do. And particularly having the elevator pitch focused on what are you solving that is broken for others. Because like no one needs another X, like you just need to do a better X. And so he realized that like, most pro shops had to hold inventory and he was direct to consumer but still giving them a margin if they sold his bag. Or that he, most minimum order quantities were 20 and he was zero. Like whatever those advantages are, like ultimately you get to the great product, but how you set up your business and having that elevator pitch, literally so that if you go to a sewing network, which I don't recommend, but if you do, like that you have an answer of what it is. Um, and I just think there's p tons of people who will help you with your elevator pitch because there's people that hear these stories over and over again. I feel like you said you answer almost every single email you get. Yes? You're nodding your head? Yes. Do you want to give your email? No, I'm kidding. We don't have to give your email. <laughs> yes. but, um, but the point is, is that like use your network, ask people, even if it's like, even if they can't advise you on your product, but they can advise you on your pitch, I think that's really important. Next question was, um, da -da -da -da. What are the most common reasons that underrepresented founders are told for being overlooked during early stage investment rounds? Okay, this assumes that someone's giving you an honest answer, but like, let's go with it. Any commonalities that you all feel like you see? Whether you were in the business or when you think about... You mean like... It's a, it was more of a tech stars question in particular, like underrepresented founders. Like why, why is it the famously overlooked? Why do you think that is? I mean, let's start with just the basic statistics. Uh, when you look at VC investments, 60% of them came from their network. 60, six, 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 zero. Six, six zero. So that starts there. Like, again, if you are not part of that network because you were born in a different place, or you went to a different school, or you, you were of a different age, whatever, whatever it is that makes you different, and you're not part of that network, here, here you have it. You have suddenly a lot less chance to be funded by VC than, than if you were part of their network. So it starts with that. Then I think we go into, uh, into how the VC industry operates a lot through pattern. And so um, they, they are used to see a certain type of founders with a certain way of explaining what they're doing with a certain type of problems that they're solving. And most, most uh, investors will try to check boxes because they don't want to take risks because they believe that they somehow have this magic pattern recognition system in their head that allow them to figure out, like, I know that you are the next, the next Zuckerberg. And like, the reality is you don't know when it's like, again, two founders and a dog, like what you know is that there is resilience, there is hard work, there is experience, there is something there, and that if you give them capital and support, you are going to increase their chance of success. And so I think there's fundamentally the system is flowed because of that. Yeah, which is why it's important to network and figure out who else has the capital, et cetera. Um, the next question, Ali, I'm going to ask you, which was, let me pull it back up. It essentially said, like, how... How do you encourage underrepresented founders to get them off the fence and go do it, pursue the big dream, particularly when the trade-off is corporate job and a safety net? Like when you were starting out early, what was it that like got you to do what you did? That got me to do it? Yeah. Because oh. I was going to say, I, I have like tried one time to convince someone to go be a founder, actually two people, and they went and took the corporate job. And I like, and then I realized you should never convince anyone to be a founder for all the reasons that like <laughs> we all like you just, you, you know, it'll be the next decade or plus of your life, and it's a lot of rejection, and it requires a lot of resilience and uh, making a lot of sacrifices. So, you never want to convince someone. I think what I was trying to do with two women that I worked with at a previous operating role who were just awesome, and there were not enough of of them in the marketplace doing great things. and They had the business, they had the tech, they had the just 
strategy and, I, and they had a really good idea and they'd prototyped it and I was like, please, 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 and I'm gonna write you a check and da 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 and like they just, they weren't, they weren't ready. Um, and and you, cannot, you cannot battle that. What got me off the bench to do, to be a, to be a founder of a management company, because I'm not a founder of a product company, but a founder of a management company. Uh, it was the Me Too Time's Up kind of period of time. I had just left um, my last full-time operating role, uh, which I enjoyed, but kind of felt like I wanted my next thing and wanted a little more purpose. And I was you know, thinking about being a VC again. I'd, I'd spent a year at Greylock, and I, I did my first principal investing training at, um, in the later stage uh, General Atlantic Partners um, firm. Knew I wanted to do early stage and just noticed this gap again in my angel investing where, God, again and again and again, like founders with some, with a really knew the customer persona, really like had something built and just were struggling to bolt together around. And then all the sort of me too, times up movement started to happen and it was hitting industry after industry in geo after geo. And I too was the only woman on a publicly traded uh, a board of directors. I was the only woman in the in the decision making. I was the only gay woman in the in the it, like in the decision making table, right? At, at company after company, at investment uh, platform after investment pl platform, and you know what it's like to be heard when you are not like other people. You have you just you you are not naturally heard by other people who do not look and sound like you. And I just felt like we need more models. We need more winners in the marketplace of Founders who represent different segments of society, different cognition, intellect, lived experience, and the only way to do that was for me to go be the change I wanted to see in the world, to push the envelope a little bit more. Um, and we've got a lot of pushing still to do, and so I'm so glad that you know the, the folks up here are where they are. That I look around the room and I, I just see like, yeah, a lot of people here like who decided to come spend time on this panel, and that like. That's awesome. That's very different from when I was at Greylock a decade ago and at GA at the beginning of the aughts, if that's what we call and it. And it's that like part easier to century. connect with people, right? Because you have like the network effect that's starting through platforms that you helped build, etc. Totally. So and and people, it's people, it's people, it's people. And I'm so glad to hear you say that like you wanna you look forward to working with other firms. Yeah. Right? Like I love it when we can help a founder build a great syndicate at the early stage because I don't have all of the answers. I don't have all the experience. But when you can work with other great people who will give you access to networks for introductions, for advice, um, that's that's awesome and it's people. It's very hard to do something great and big at scale alone. It's, it's nearly impossible. Okay, so you said the people. Tashi, I wanna ask you, it says, I wanna find early stage diverse founders to work for do you have any tips for looking for those type of companies from an employee perspective? So like when you think about the businesses that you back and them being attracted to certain employees that they're hiring on, is there anything that like you've heard from your founders given how tough it is to like find good people? Like any, th any practices that you see that you admire? Um, well, I want to touch on the, I want to touch on like the previous point that, yeah, that they mentioned. Um, I think, uh, you know, growing up, uh, with with Asian parents, I think one of the the big thing is that you're not told that being a founder is an option, right? So I think one of the most important things when people say, "Hey, um, I'm thinking about this," is is letting them know that that it's an option, right? So I think that's a that's a huge a huge factor. It's it seems small, but it's actually very huge mentally, um, having come from that culture. Um, and, and then, by the way, I even like took for granted so. I, I work with a mix of like the blue chip names, the KKRs, the Blackstones, et cetera, of the world. And then we've been backing in and trying to find ways to get into the earlier stage side. And there was like um, one of the Asian American business resource groups within JP Morgan was putting together an event for clients. And they were like, oh, can we ask Joe Bay, et cetera, who was at KKR? And I was like, well, I don't know if he'd want to do, like, I don't know if he'd want to do that or not. And he was like, yeah. This is like my passion. Like there's people that come from underrepresented groups that like we sort of don't even know if we should ask each other to like do yeah. certain things. And then it's like, duh, like, yeah, of course they'd want to do it. It doesn't matter how successful you are. You want to give back. And that's part of why we'll talk at the end about like the connections that we can make across JP Morgan for any clients. We bank one and two households in America and Chase. Like there's a lot of power that you can get, whether you're smaller, more established, been in this business for a short period of time or a long period of time that I think um, you kind of need to be reminded of once in a while. But yeah, no, no, for sure. And, and to answer your, your question, um, I think 
I, I think it's hard, right? It's, it's really hard to find uh, these companies. So what, what we try to do is be that voice. You know, luckily we have a reach to 400 million people. So when we invest, we try to talk about it and say, hey, this is why we invested and, and, and here are the founders. So I think that's, a, that's another way that we try to be helpful is really unlock our enterprise. Jacqueline, what would you say as you think about people that you've backed, cultures that have been created, and how people should think about, from an employee perspective, what's attractive or what to look for? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's really hard. Um, I know, you know a bunch of my friends that are founders um, that just like on a personal level, they've interviewed more than like 100 people just for one job. And that culture, you know, it has to be a good fit for both sides. Um, but I think... You know, it, it starts with just, like, the network. Uh, back to that. Back to, like, what are some things that are you're interested in? Like, you know, for instance, um, I'm part of this group called Pitch and Run, which we meet on Mondays and Fridays um, in New York City. And we, we bring together founders and investors. And it's a great way for us to go on a five-mile run for you know, founders to pitch ideas to investors and it's a, and it creates a network, right? And so we can, you know, help each other out. We've become a family and um, so it's things like that. So things that you're interested in, getting gr groups of people together, have them each bring a person. Say, you know, you have some founder friends and, you know, they're, they, and investor friends, and you, like each person has to bring someone new to a dinner party of some nature. Um, so there's like ways to be involved or going to events, uh, but it's, it's, it's hard. There's no real like easy answer to, uh, to, the, to the question. Okay, so I'm gonna finish with the question for all of you, which is like best advice you were given that either kept you going or got you going. So think about that. But Mayel, one question, so you don't get much time to think about it. Um, one question that did come in for you. It says, you advised finding potential investors in new social circles. As an investor, where do you meet individuals you would invest in outside of work? Maybe that's like your personal account? I don't know. Do you invest outside of Techstars? Uh, not really. I mean, yeah. we have compliance issues that. <laughs> <laughs> I work at a bank. You don't have to tell me yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, so I guess part of it is, um, maybe I'll change the question a little bit. It says, where do you meet? Okay, so you're not going to sewing conferences anymore. What are, we're like, or, or like now that you have all these, um, I know we work together to like go to a couple cities that matter both to JP Morgan and tech stars. Like, what, are there non-obvious things that people should be going to or networking? Um, I think you should, I mean, it, it's, it's gonna sound weird, but I think you, besides, besides the business that you're focused on, Hopefully, you have some hobbies, whether it's running, uh, kill, like sewing, as you say, this sewing, is yeah. sewing, whatever that is. And you'd be amazed by the number of people you're going to find in this network. And I think the more you can actually have a life outside of your business, and I know it sounds counterintuitive, but a lot of the best relationship from a business perspective that I have ever had, they came from people that I randomly met at an airport, at a cooking class, going to a friend's wedding, it doesn't matter. It was basically about just going and just again, go. go and talk to your business until even you can't stand it anymore to talk about it. Yeah. It's just talking, talking, talking. You're right, because sometimes you get so bogged down with like the emails and everything else, and you're like, eh, do I need to go? Like, just go. Yeah. Just All stop right. the email, talk to people. I usually like f um, give a woman the last word, but since there's more women than men, Tasha, I'm going to start with you. On the like um, advice that you were given and or that you give, what would you say? I think the, the, the best lesson that I guess I've had is never accept no for an answer. Um, you know, being early stage VC, you get a, a thousand no's. We're, we're, we're very similar to founders where most of the times when we talk to a, um, a pr prospective investor, the, the answer is no. And same, same thing for when we invest, 99 times a say, we say, you know, the, the, the answer is gonna be no, but um, I think having that grit and, and what, what that ultimately comes down to is like, do you really love what you're doing? So if you really love what you're doing, um, I think you get to persevere. So yeah, having that grit. I do say like, if you get a no, ask why. Like, I think it's sometimes so important. Like you leave a meeting, you're like, I can't believe it. And then all of a sudden you like start making things up when it really had nothing to do with you. Like, I think that to your point, don't accept a no, but if you do get a no, like don't be afraid to go back, whether it's like even later to say, like, I just got to ask, 
what yeah, was yeah, it or you know sure. what, what didn't what didn't I do or what would you have been attracted to, et cetera? I think that's super important. Yeah, and also um, I think it's great to take calls with uh, a, t a teammate if you if you have a co-founder because that way you have two different perspectives because a lot of times you're you're in it and you just don't see it. That's fair. Jacqueline, what would you say? Yeah, I would say it's what you do when you fall, like how do you get back up and what are the things that you learn from that mistake or that, you know, the failure to like help you rise again and it's that pr consistent effort um, and that grit. Um, so it'd be something I'd, I'd take with me. It's so true. When I was at this annual meeting this week with um, a bunch of people uh, earlier today, actually, um, it was like people from like Snowflake and, you know, Dara from Uber and all this stuff. And everyone, you kind of see the end product and you don't see like, all the trials and tribulations along the way, or like even Jeff Bezos at Amazon, like how long it actually took to sort of be successful. Um, and so a lot of the founders that I got to meet over the last couple of days were like, it's not if it's when you hit a wall and then what you do to get back. And like most of the time it's like you hit a wall, you keep going, you hit a wall, you keep going. And so to your point, getting back up, I think is important. Maya, what would you say? The best advice I ever got was from my grandfather, who was a World War veteran, and he told me, as I was complaining about God knows what, uh, we are French, French tend to complain a lot, so uh, it was like, you know, nothing worth doing in life is easy. And every time I'm about to complain, like funneling my inner French, I remember what my grandfather was telling me. And as an entrepreneur, that has been for me like the, the North Star. Yeah. Nothing worth doing is ever easy. So it's OK. Let's just keep going. I like that. I, every time I have a bad day, I'm like, tomorrow is going to be so much better. And then every time I have a good day, I'm like, brace for the bad. You know, like, don't ever be, you know, and I'm whatever. I'm from a Greek and Italian family, so we're just psychotically anxious. OK. <laughs> Ali, what would you say? I mean, play the long game. Uh, I think. So much of when you're raising money for the first time or even uh, multiple times, you are the product in many ways and how you carry yourself um, in the world and with partners and with customers and investors. You know, I mean, think about playing the long game. You, you might pitch an investor twice, your seed round and then your A round. Um, you know, you can learn from them. They can learn from you. Um, and, and just think about how you want to show up in every interaction um, with, that, with that in mind, that relationships are long and that um, if you're building for the long run, uh, you're confident in yourself, you believe in yourself, you believe in your team, you believe in what you're trying to do. Some people will hear you and some people won't and that, that comes, you know, that's that resilience bit which is like, okay, maybe you didn't tell the story perfectly but it may be that you just didn't tell a story that someone else was only, they were only listening for one thing. It doesn't mean you're bad or that your idea is bad or that you don't deserve to be as much as they do. Uh, so I just think thinking about like knowing yourself and thinking about how you want to show up with that long, that long game in, in mind is, uh, is what I would advise. I like that. The, one of the, my favorite quotes that I just picked up in the last week, <laughs> it said, no matter how great, and I just had a, I have a seven month old baby, so like watching her do things week by week is like really fun, uh, but also exhausting. Anyways. It said, no matter how great the talents or the efforts, some things just take time. You can't produce a baby in one month by getting nine women pregnant. Turns out that was Warren Buffett that said that. Um, but the point is, like, you have to be in the long game. There are no shortcuts. It is brutal. It's about working with each other and leaning on each other, which is incredible. And most importantly, is building the network. This um, breakout was sponsored by J.P. Morgan Capital Connect. And so just one more shout out. It's right outside. It's OK. We're pointing that way. Um, for those that don't know, the concept was, was that JP Morgan, we realized that we have this incredible network across all of our lines of businesses. And we realized and recognized a lot of what we talked about today, that ideas are everywhere, but capital is not. And we wanted to find a way to connect GPs to LPs, LPs to ideas, GPs to ideas. And so there's, if you don't have time to do it, we can send you some more information afterwards, but there's like benchmarking. You want to know how do you benchmark yourself? How do you produce valuations? How do you do any of those things? You want to know about cap tables. Who's on whose cap tables? What does it look like? They use all this artificial intelligence and this technology to scrape the web to actually produce the information. It's pretty incredible. There's capital raising information on there. Um, you can actually manage your own capital raise through the system, which is pretty incredible. So you don't have to like use all these different systems or build your own. You can use ours, which is awesome. 
There's a whole networking thing, which I mentioned. And then there's this eco, we're, we're going to call it the ecosystem. It's all the third-party service providers that you can use when you're getting started to help make your life easier. So we do it because over time we want you to work with us, but we do it because we also know that we have this incredible power of creating that network for you. And in particular, with the overlooked, um, that is where our focus is. That's where we think the next big ideas are going to come from. So we're going to continue to invest behind those that are in this room. I thank you for joining us. I thank our panelists. We'll stick around for a few minutes afterwards. And that's all.